thanks for joining us again. Another one of our Safer at Home series. Um, um, I think this is our first one of the, of the summer of, uh, of 2021. So uh, uh, thank you for joining us. And uh, yes, what a difference a year makes when we were doing this in, uh, in uh, June and July of 2020, we were in a totally different circumstance. So um, uh, thank you for joining us. Um, before we get started tonight, um, uh, as, as with all our talks, uh, this one's brought to us by Cape Cod 5 for Citizens Federal Credit Union and Martha's Vineyard Savings. And um, all the books on our series are available at Eight Cousins Bookseller in Falmouth. So we hope that you uh, go visit the locals. Um, our guest tonight, Lawrence Burgreen, is an award-winning biographer, historian, chronicler of exploration. His books have been translated in over 25 languages worldwide. He's coming to us from Manhattan, and um, I'm going to be his little uh, techie. So um, uh, I'm I'm the one when he says advance the slide, it's it's on me. So um, if if there's a video glitch, don't blame that. Don't blame him. It's me. So uh, without further ado, would you welcome uh, Lawrence Burgery? Thank you. Techies are crucial to all of this. Um, and thank you to, uh, I'm very glad to see you. I'm glad to, that you could be here tonight. I'm speaking to you from my home in Manhattan, but uh, the spiritual home of this book really is um, uh, Martha's Vineyard, Nantucket and Cape Cod, where I've spent so many summers um, throughout my life. And uh, where my son, uh, who is a competitive sailor, has uh, taken me out on the water for many adventures. And it was during all of those that I began conceiving um, about books, uh, beginning with the Magellan book and going on to this one um, about sailing and what uh, can be done um, with it to make it exciting for modern audiences. I actually think it's incredibly exciting and uh, uh, daring and death defying. Uh, Francis Drake was as colorful a character from the Elizabethan era as you could uh, hope to meet. Um, like um, uh, his, uh, his queen, Queen Elizabeth, um, he was red-haired, um, he was a pirate. Um, we, took, we, we think of him as an explorer, he would have been astonished by that description because he was after gold and he was a pirate. His goals were primarily uh, commercial um, and uh, monetary. Um, he was not really interested in, in gathering knowledge, um, although he certainly was interested in glory. Um, he came from Devon, um, which is in uh, southern England. Some of you may have been there. It's, uh, it's a beautiful area. In Drake's day, it was very, very poor. And uh, he was the youngest, he was the oldest, rather, of 11 or 12 children. Um, and he came from a rather modest background. Um, since uh, it was so, work was uh, so scarce to come by there, many people, many men went to sea. Um, in search of it, and uh, Drake was one of them. So as a teenager, he was already um, learning his um, craft at, aboard uh, um, merchant uh, ships and eventually even uh, slave ships. For a while, uh, England dabbled in the slave trade, uh, which uh, ultimately, I guess to Drake's credit, uh, repelled him, and uh, he refused to do it and took a big step back. But for a while, uh, his first exposure to seafaring around Devon was through his cousin, Sir John Hawkins, um, who was a prominent uh, slaver and captain in the area. And that's where uh, Drake cut his teeth. Um, if we wanna just go to the first slide, please, and take a look at him. Here is Drake um, in uh, his finery. This was after he had made it. Um, we're gonna be talking about a much younger Drake um, who was, uh, ambitious, extremely skillful um, as a sailor, and also quite lucky. Um, he did not grow up dreaming uh, about circumnavigating the world. He uh, dreamed about getting wealthy. And his way of doing that was to uh, steal gold from England's great rival at that time, which was Spain. Um, the world was really divided between Spain and everyone else in those days. Spain was the, um, you know, by far the largest, wealthiest empire. Uh, the king, Philip, um, was, uh, you know, deeply religious, um, had seemingly endless amounts of money uh, from the gold that he 
essentially harvested and stole from uh, Central and South America, brought back to S Spain uh, on treasure ships, and um, then uh, frittered away on rather needless, useless uh, foreign wars. But uh, Spain was the bastion. England at that time was almost negligible. I know it's kind of hard to believe, but um, England at one brief time had a small colony on the coast of France, uh, lost that, um, then uh, became an isolated island nation and uh, was poor and in danger of breaking up uh, at this time. Um, Spain, of course, was a unified Catholic country um, and then also further strengthened by um, an alliance uh, with Rome and the Pope. Um, England, ever since Henry VIII, had um, been uh, fractured or fragmented uh, by hen by hen and into two um, faiths. And although, you know, if we were to come back and look at a uh, a Anglican service at that time, it would, unless we were highly observant, look like a Catholic service. Nevertheless, uh, there were two types of uh, English people in those days. There were the um, Catholics, and there were many of them, and then there were the uh, rather new, newer, newly minted Anglicans, and um, they. Uh, this was a potential for civil war, um, and there was also a potential for Spain to invade England at any time. Um, Elizabeth, as you probably know, came uh, to power at the age of 25 uh, through a very unlikely set of circumstances. Um, and uh, was uh, tough, quick-witted, very smart, well-educated. Um, as a child, she had grown up and learned um, uh, languages of antiquity. Um, and uh, she was, um, you know, so she gradually came into her own. Um, the hazards of being a queen of England at that point were innumerable. Um, assassination was ever-present um, and poison. Uh, there, England had never had a queen. It was expected that she would marry soon. Of course, the second she did is she knew that she, she would lose her uh, power and the power would flow to her husband. So she was determined never to marry. She became therefore the quote, virgin queen, although virgin was meant perhaps in a more um, uh, kind of a general sense, uh, because it seems apparent that she did have some, some lovers um, during her reign, but uh, she always kept her distance from people. Um, she was cunning, she was to say the least, and she was Machiavellian. And uh, when necessary, she could be uh, quite cruel. Um, she had little regard at first for uh, Francis Drake, whom she regarded as just another um, wannabe pirate, if you will, from uh, Devon. But uh, gradually he came to his, her attention um, with some of his early raids against the Spanish and bringing back gold to, to England. Why was this so important? Because England was broke. Um, it didn't have any money. And uh, it was very important uh, to have something. And uh, you know, Drake understood that and he understood the importance of, of gold, which essentially he stole from Spain uh, and, and then brought to England. So he had started out uh, stealing slaves from Spain um, and uh, and bringing them to England. Then when England got out of the slave trade, he switched over to gold, which was much more of his liking, and he became uh, very skillful at it. Could we have the next slide, please? Uh, this is, um, Drake uh, was uh, thought about, it's not clear if he actually thought about his circumnavigation. Um, he certainly proposed an expedition uh, to the coast of South America, to Brazil, uh, to bring back um, gold and other items that would be very valuable and precious uh, to England. And this is a copy that was, as you can see, burned in a fire of the original document. Um, and uh, at that time, the idea of circumnavigating the world seemed like a pretty bad idea. Uh, Magellan had done it, Ferdinand Magellan had done it about 60 years earlier, as I wrote about in my book, um, Over the Edge of the World. Um, most everybody died. Uh, most of the ships were lost. Um, it was a voyage to disaster that took three years. 
Magellan himself was killed in the Philippines when he stumbled into a very unnecessary war with a, a local uh, battle with a local warrior. Um, so after that, Magellan, if anything, seemed to prove that it was not worth it to circumnavigate the world. And if he wanted to bring spices back uh, from um, Asia, which is what he was trying to do, it was better to do it the old fashioned way, which was to go in the other direction um, on foot. Um, uh, Drake thought it might be possible to do this sort of thing over water. Anyway, he it wasn't sure. He wasn't sure, but he had one big advantage. And that was he had Magellan's experience. He had some maps and he had some transcripts and pilot's logs, and he had the benefit of Magellan's mistakes, uh, which turned out to be a huge benefit and made his voyage much easier um, all the way around. So he stood on Magellan's shoulders and therefore was able to become the first circumnavigator. Um, next slide, please. Let's take a look at his route a little bit. And uh, you can see that he left from England, uh, sailed south and all the way to South America um, and uh, along the coast of Brazil, um, further and further south. Um, he approached what was that then called the Strait of Magellan, which had been Magellan's amazing discovery. Um, on his circumnavigation, which made it possible to circumnavigate the world. Um, nobody really knew if it existed before Drake discovered it. Um, he had heard about it by rumor and uh, had made some several false starts, uh, went in with his ships and um, could tell whether he was getting closer or further uh, from the ocean on either side of the strait by tasting the water. If it was salty, he knew he was near the ocean. If it got sweeter, he knew he was inland. Um, so he proceeded through the strait, and uh, I'll show you some pictures of it in a minute. And um, that was, an, and if, it, if there was one feat that marked his voyage before uh, Drake's, um, it was this uh, circuit, it was crossing the strait. Um, having done that, he was then primed to go across the Pacific, um, Drake followed basically in his tracks um, all with very slight deviation all the way around uh, and uh, going north along the coast of South America. As you can see, he kept going further and further north until he got to North America, even further um, all the way up um, along the coast of uh, Oregon, California, um, and uh, much further than most people realize Drake actually went. Um, why was Drake going so far north when, when it appeared to be out of his way when he was trying to get to the Spice Islands? Um, he was looking for a rumored Northwest Passage, which in his mind seemed as real as the Strait of Magellan, except the Northwest Passage didn't exist. And he, he eventually gave up. And you can see he makes a, a sharp turn and he heads out into the Pacific and uh, speeds along um, to uh, you know, the Moluccas, which is where these valuable spices were. Why were spices so valuable that uh, nations were willing to mount these elaborate expeditions to get them? Because uh, they were the most important medium of exchange. Um, they were not only used as spices or for medicinal purposes, uh, they were used as currency. And uh, so they, they served this double purpose. And so they were highly sought after, uh, especially clothes and cinnamon. Uh, but those are the others, just, you know, ordinary clothes and cinnamon were, you know, more valuable than gold. Uh, for example, when uh, Magellan had, had an opportunity to load his, one of his ships with gold, which he had captured, or spices, he chose spices. Uh, to put on his ships because he considered them to be uh, more valuable. Um, Drake took three years uh, to perform this, you know, amazing feat of navigation. Again, you know, drawing on the maps and charts that uh, um, Magellan had uh, left behind, or I should say his, his map makers, because uh, one of the, you know, 
tragedies of, of Magellan's voyage was that he was killed in the middle of it and he lost all, you know, we lost all his papers and charts and so on. They all went to Davy Jones' locker. So uh, I, on the other hand, some of the survivors uh, left an important record. Um, there was one especially by his de designated diarist, Antonio Pigafetta, who wrote uh, a famous voyage around the world you might want to check out to give a sense of actually what it's like to sail around the world. Um, with Drake, um, his, uh, his uh, main clergy uh, representative, uh, Francis Fletcher, also wrote you know, his version of what it was like to sail around the world uh, with Francis Drake. Um, the two of them encountered some, some severe problems. I just want to back up for a second. Um, when they were on the coast of uh, Brazil, they both faced mutinies. Mutinies were very common in these days. Um, they were especially uh, popular or uh, likely to happen because there was a conflict between the working sailors on the ship and the nobility. And that happened to, to Magellan and it happened again to Drake. Um, Magellan uh, executed um, you know, the offenders uh, and uh, Drake actually had to confront an English nobleman on the voyage uh, which was difficult for him to do because he was not yet a noble, nobleman at that point. Um, and uh, he felt that, um, you know, if it was, seemed likely that after he had the a mutineer uh, executed, when he got back to England, it's possible that he himself might be tr uh, tried and executed for having done this. Why did he execute him? Was it actually a terrible mutiny? And the answer is no. Uh, Drake was very superstitious and believed that this mutineer was a witch. Um, there were male and female witches in Elizabethan England. They were very popular. Shakespeare uh, references them a number of times. They were a subject of great discussion. And uh, Drake felt that this witch was going to, you know, turn the entire voyage against him and had to be, um, you know, isolated and put to death. So. Uh, that's what he did, but it was all driven by superstition. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, here I am aboard a replica of Drake's primary ship. This is in London. It's a very accurate replica, and it's called the Golden Hind, um, and it's tied up at uh, St. Mary Overy Dock in London. If you're there as a tourist, you could go see it. It's a you know really terrific um, tourist attraction. Um, you will get a sense of uh, how sturdy the ship is. And you can see a little bit of the bulk there behind me in the, in the photograph. Um, you will also see how tiny it is. And uh, when you imagine the ship sailing, not just across the Atlantic, but around the world, you know, it's, it's, it's really rather incredible. Nevertheless, uh, Drake managed to, um, uh, you know, stay, keep, keep this craft safe and sound um, all the way around. Uh, next slide, please. Um, also, I wanted to was a, I wanted to show you this picture. This is the Strait of Magellan, uh, which I had mentioned to you. This is one of the most perhaps fabled or storied uh, parts of the entire planet. Uh, I think sleeping on the beach behind me are some sea lions, and you know it's a nice sunny day in the Strait. It wasn't always that way, but uh, it's it was rather placid and it was sheltered, um, it's, a, it's a fjord. So when Drake and uh, Magellan and then their successors came through, um, they, they found themselves in, in sort of a safe, you know, or protected area. Um, but occasionally terrible storms would blow up called willowars. And when that happened, um, air that was super cool would come rushing down the sides of those steep mountains. You can see some of them in the back and uh, go slamming into the water uh, below, and it was enough to tear any, any, shape, any ship apart. Um, fortunately, uh, Drake did not encounter any willowards directly. And also fortunately, he had the benefit of Drake's maps to show him the fastest way through the strait, which is kind of a, a puzzle. So this way he didn't have to waste any time with dead ends and getting lost and uh, he knew 
which way he was going and when he would finally emerge in the Pacific. Next slide, please. Um, oh, I had talked about this uh, rebellion earlier and the mutiny. Um, here is an illustration of it. Um, John Doughty was the offender's name. And this is a, you know, afterward, a artist's impression of what it was like when he was uh, uh, beheaded. Um, Port St. Julian was the name of the place where this occurred. The same place where Magellan had executed his mutineer. So it's, uh, I think it wasn't coincidence. It's, it's just a strange sort of thing. And it's one of the first places they got to when they uh, reached Brazil. One can surmise that tensions that had formed during their crossing of the Atlantic boiled over uh, by the time they got to this place. Um, there, there are some other e interesting and eerie comparisons uh, between these two circumnavigations, but you know this is certainly one of the most striking. Um, next slide, please. Uh, this is a view of what the Indians looked like, so-called Indians, um, or local tribes people, um, to Europeans. Uh, de Bry was a very popular illustrator, and many Europeans at that time, when they thought about what it looked like in uh, South America around uh, the Strait of Magellan um, and what Drake might have seen, uh, you know, envisioned or saw it through de Bry's eyes. He, he uh, you know, produced many of these etchings and, uh, you know, gave a sense of the uh, muscularity and the um, bellicosity of the, of, uh, the Indians. Um, and uh, in fact, um, they really weren't that warlike. Uh, many of them were rather welcoming um, to Drake, which was fortunate because when the Spanish, if the Spanish had preceded them, um, they often treated them terribly. And uh, they regarded uh, Europeans, uh, you know, in a very wary way. And uh, Drake often had to be aware of the fact that uh, he might be mistaken for a Spaniard. And if he was, he, was, he would then be considered an antagonist and a target. Um, but uh, if he wasn't, then he got a much, a much more peaceful uh, greeting. Um, okay, let's, uh, let's keep going. Uh, the next slide, please. Um, this is, uh, oh, this, this is, will advance the story. Uh, when he got further north along the coast of uh, Oregon and uh, uh, of California and Oregon, um, he decided to declare a region that would be in, named after his queen, Elizabeth, and he wanted to call it New Albion. Albion is a, a traditional name for, for England. Um, he may have had uh, fantasies of uh, ruling it himself. That's not as far-fetched as it sounded uh, because in the earlier part of his career, when he was hunting for gold to, speak, to steal from Spain um, in, in Central America, he formed an alliance with a group known as the Cimarrons. And the Cimarrons um, wanted him to be their leader. And he thought long and hard about that. But of course, that would mean giving up his, his, his allegiance to England. And ultimately, he wasn't willing to do that. But there was always a tendency in Drake that uh, he wanted to go his own way, perhaps start his own kingdom. Um, and then the, you know, the temptation, not the temptation, but the lure of gold and getting, you know, and, and getting titles and, and uh, status from, from Elizabeth and from England um, would, you know, prove too much and that overruled it. Um, okay, let's keep going, please. Uh, one of his last stops on the circumnavigation was in Indonesia. Uh, this was the goal of Magellan's circumnavigation. This is what he came for, was to get all the spices here uh, and to trade. This was uh, several islands, Ternate, Tidore, and, and some others. Um, by the time Drake got here, though, he just wasn't interested. He had already filled up on gold 
in his ships. And he, uh, you know, wasn't really interested in spices. He had pulled off one of the most famous heists at sea um, a little bit earlier off the west coast of uh, South America uh, when he came across a Spanish treasure fleet uh, known as Cacafuego, uh, ship fire. And um, that was filled with gold and uh, he managed to relieve the captain and the crew of all of it, transfer a lot of it onto his ship and, uh, and carry it away. Um, so for him, that justified the, the entire voyage. And, and that wasn't his only raid. He went up and down the, along the west coast of uh, South America, particularly, and um, raiding Spanish camps um, who seemed to be very poorly interested and very lackadaisical about guarding their gold um, and may, simply made off of it. Uh, Drake himself was always very careful uh, to stay away from the heat of battle most of the time. Um, he let a few of his sailors uh, um, on shore to you know, carry out the mission and then get back into to their safety of their boats as soon as possible. Uh, but he, stay, he himself generally re remained out of the line of fire. Um, he, he wanted to be a survivor. Uh, anyway, so after a lot of these raids, their, their ships were groaning with gold. So spices were, were no longer interesting. So they seem to have uh, belonged to a previous uh, generation of, uh, of explorers. Um, furthermore, Indonesia and the Spice Islands had changed. Um, next slide, please. Uh, uh, here is um, Drake uh, being received at the, on, on the island of Ternate in the Moluccas, but it was not the warm reception that the survivors of Magellan's mission had gotten. Uh, this was a new generation of rulers, and they weren't that interested in the recent history and they regarded uh, Drake as a possible uh, interloper or, you know, problem. And uh, they, 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 were, they did not extend uh, the hand of uh, friendship to them. They weren't necessarily hostile, but, uh, you know, they, there was not a sense of, uh, you know, kinship or camaraderie or bonding that uh, some of Magellan's men had experienced um, in the Moluccas. And uh, so Drake... Um, basically after a brief visit, kept on going. Uh, next, next slide, please. Uh, oh, here's a rather fanciful illustration of, uh, you know, the, the Drake loading the treasure um, onto his ship. And uh, you can get some sense of his, you know, uh, physical uh, being there. You know, as, as, it, as he, you can tell from this picture, he was, kind of short, uh, maybe five, 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 six, which would not be short by Elizabethan standards, but perhaps by, by ours, and stocky. Um, and his girth um, increased as he got older. And uh, so, um, but he always was, had this distinctive red hair and uh, was uh, also his disposition, Magellan's disposition was it's hard to say because nobody really wrote much about it, but I, I surmise it was rather gloomy and serious um, and uh, very focused. Uh, Drake was a robust Elizabethan um, who loved to joke and to drink. Um, he loved uh, all sorts of games um, and gambling. And, uh, you know, he had a sense of fun and playfulness about him uh, that was often absent in his Spanish counterparts. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is a really important figure I want to talk about for a few minutes, um, unbelievably enough. Uh, I know this scene sounds like it comes out of a, straight out of a Harry Potter novel. Uh, John Dee was the queen's um, magician and also cast horoscopes for her. Um, and he played a key role um, in her life and in the birth of the British Empire. Um, he had been educated um, at Oxford. He was very well educated. He was brilliant. He was considered one of the smartest men in Europe. He had a huge uh, private library 
And, uh, you know, he had a, a vision among other things. Oh, he was also a brilliant mathematician. He introduced math mathematical symbols such as um, plus and minus and divided by into, uh, into England. They did not use them before then. I don't know how they got along. Uh, so, you know, he was a very important part of her brain trust, if you will. Uh, he was also a mystic. Um, in those days, there was no difference between astronomy and astrology. Uh, they were the same. And uh, he um, believed that uh, he could um, see um, or, or hear the spirits in, in another world uh, by looking at a stone called a scrying stone. Uh, there's one on display in the uh, British Museum, and I'm sure you can look on, online, uh, which was a, a, a disc um, that was about three or four inches in diameter that you held in your hand and was a portal to another world. Uh, I, you know, I had mentioned how um, uh, superstitious Drake had been, but it wasn't just Drake. I mean, Dean, Dean who was as intellectual as, as anyone in England at that time, um, you know, you know, believed in a more refined version of the same kind of phenomena. Um, and Elizabeth trusted him greatly. He, she relied on him to pick the date of her coronation, uh, which of course was he date, as well as other uh, important dates uh, during her reign. So, you know, he, he was a kind of a court mystic among other things. Here he is, you know, displaying some something and with fire and, and some sort of experiment, uh, but he was a highly influential character. Um, some of his uh, writings can be found, he, he wrote a tremendous amount of uh, book treatises. He also wrote a great deal in the margins of books. And you might say, well, so what? But in those days, writing in the margins of books was a, was, was a big deal. And uh, he often wrote a huge amount in the margins of these books, which almost amounted to another book. Um, I came across some of them when I was doing, to my surprise, when I was doing research in New York on the, in the New York Society Library, where they had the books from his library, you know, on, on available there uh, with these, you know, copious uh, marginal notes. Um, he also wrote um, an important manifesto that became the basis for uh, Great Britain. Um, he thought nobody had used that term before, but he thought that you know it should be an empire, um, it should be the center of the world, uh, and uh, you know that Elizabeth should rule it. Um, and he wrote it all in kind of uh, flowery, um, poetic terms, almost as if William Blake, the poet, um, had. Uh, had, had, had written it. Um, and uh, he was, he and Elizabeth then were the first people to conceive of this idea of the British Empire. Um, when we started the story, there was, there was no, no British Empire and, and, and no idea of it. Um, once that idea, you know, became accepted, um, it took hold and gradually became a reality. But at that time, as just to remind you, Spain was the dominant force um, not England. Um, we all know the expression, the sun never sets on the English empire. But in those days, the expression was, the sun never sets on the Spanish empire, because it didn't. Um, but gradually, gradually, um, Spain, England uh, began to supplant Spain um, and her allies um, as the shape of uh, global politics changed. Okay, next slide, please. Um, when Drake finished his circumnavigation, um, he finished it, by the way, in secret. Um, it was rather anticlimactic. Um, Elizabeth was afraid at, that King Philip of Spain at any time would invade England um, and was much, much, was much more powerful. And there were a few things she was afraid of. First of all, they would take back, they'd steal all the gold that uh, Drake had brought with him. The second thing is that she was afraid that um, they would come and get her and kidnap her and bring her back to Spain, where she might be tried, she might be executed. Um, King Philip had also 
expressed a uh, you know fondness for her. Um, you know he you know she might it wasn't clear what his intentions were. Um, also, the Pope spoke about her in leering terms, oddly enough, um, at that time. Anyway, uh, she was very concerned that England would be overrun by you know much a much bigger country. So when Drake returned, um, she denied that you know anything had happened. Um, all the gold, uh, the ship was hidden in the Tower of London, along with all the gold. And it would be several years before word got out as to what he had done, i.e. circumnavigated the world, which was an astounding accomplishment, and be brought enough gold and gems back to keep England afloat, as it were, um, for years. So it was a, uh, you know, huge accomplishment. Um, but she wanted to keep it, you know, keep it quiet to the extent that she could. Um, she did knight Drake. So here's a rather um, fanciful um, illustration of uh, knighting uh, Drake. Um, and it looks like she did it herself. And that's the way it goes down um, in many accounts and history books. In reality, in this, because of her fear about uh, King Philip, at the last second, she stepped aside. She had a sword that she was going to tap him on the shoulder with. And knight him, uh, Sir Francis Drake, um, and gave it to the ambassador from France and said to him, basically, here, you do it. Um, that way, she would uh, be less culpable um, of, uh, of her involvement um, with Francis Drake. Um, nevertheless, the deed was done, and Drake became, um, all at once, a very important, wealthy, uh, person in England and uh, kind of an overnight phenomenon after this heroic circumnavigation. Um, next slide, please. She gave him uh, this amazing manor, which is now on the National Trust. You can go visit it, called Buckland Abbey. It had been a Cistercian monastery uh, before it became a private house, but it still retained many of the monastic kind of spaces and gloom. Um, as you can tell, even from this outside view. Um, by this time, uh, Drake had been married. Um, his wife, Mary, died shortly after he got back. They had no children, um, but he did not remain a bachelor long. I think it was Elizabeth who arranged for him to um, remarry um, to a noble woman named Elizabeth Sydenham. Um, again, no children, and they lived in Buckland Abbey, which you see here. Uh, but uh, Drake didn't spend much time here. It was thought that he would settle down and spend the rest of his life, uh, you know, in comfortable uh, and respectable splendor. Um, and it, he seemed to be doing that because um, he became the mayor of Plymouth. Um, he invested successfully in real estate. Um, he became a member of parliament. Um, so joined the, the British establishment of uh, and, um, however, he was also restless and, you know, longed to go back to sea and said that he was, that's where he was happiest. So eventually this just became his home base. And he went off on one voyage, usually chasing the Spanish, um, after another and, you know, do, doing what he had always done. Uh, okay. Next slide, please. Uh, here is his Drake's second wife, uh, Elizabeth Sydenham, whom I mentioned. You can see her in all her finery, uh, you know, very much the, the lady. Okay, next slide, please. Um, the next and perhaps the culminating um, campaign of, of Drake's career um, was his defeat of the Spanish Armada, um, which came uh, seven, eight years later after he completed his circumnavigation. Um, in, in a sense, he was now uh, finishing what he started. Um, I had mentioned that Spain kept menacing England uh, throughout this time. Uh, Drake um, was almost alone in not being intimidated by Spain's taunts and uh, decided he was going to um, invade uh, their harbor, which he did. Um, and uh, uh, sank a lot of ships. And then that, that led to a huge reaction 
uh, from Spain. I think I mentioned to you that Philip had been afraid for years that uh, Spain was going to invade England, and they finally did. This was in the summer of 1588. This then this uh, you know this had been brewing for years, provoked in part by Drake, in part by uh, Elizabeth. Um, Spain sent a huge fleet, well over a hundred ships. They were very highly decorated. They were very sophisticated. Um, they uh, had several thousand sailors, and it looked like they were all set to finally conquer England. Uh, Drake was part of a force that resisted them. Um, he was not the leader of it, by the way. Uh, that was uh, uh, that was uh, Howard Effingham was the head of the Navy at that point, um, whom Drake served, and they, they had a work together, as far as I can tell, a, a, a good working relationship. Um, and uh, the uh, Spanish Armada was defeated, not so much by English forces, but by the weather. Um, this was the era of the LCO, the Little Climactic Optimum, which meant that the weather was really terrible. And they hit uh, very, very severe storms that blew apart uh, the Spanish ships, uh, which were less seaworthy than the English ships. And the English ships were nowhere near as, as a luxurious um, or as well fitted out as Spain's, but they were more seaworthy, and the English sailors were, were better sailors, um, and they knew how to handle the open sea in a way that uh, English, uh, I'm sorry, that the Spanish uh, sailors could not. Um, well, anyway, these arrows you know, you give a sense, but essentially um, the Sp Spain was forced to flee north um, all the way uh, around Scotland and Ireland in order to take the long way back to Spain. Um, many of the ships perished along the way. Thousands of Spanish sailors died. Uh, some washed up on the shore, on the shores of Ireland and Scotland. Um, a few were treated well, many were killed on the spot. Um, and uh, eventually, you know, the, the survivors made their way back to Spain. Um, England uh, had uh, a very, uh, it's so funny that with the irony of this, uh, the survivors of, the Spanish survivors were treated well by King Philip. Um, Elizabeth left many of her victorious sailors to die. Um, when they came back, um, England could not, and England, Elizabeth, who was very cheap, um, could not afford to feed them and uh, didn't want to pay anybody who died, their widows and uh, uh, their pensions. And so it was considered to be uh, the simpler, more, you know, budget conscious thing to do was that they were expendable. Uh, sailors aboard ships, you know, caught scurvy or other diseases, dysentery and died very quickly. And the English made a calculated decision to let their own sailors die off. Um, and so they did. And as I mentioned, you know, Elizabeth had her, uh, her you know, devious and, and dark side. And, you know, here you see it. Um, in, anyway, this way, uh, England managed to preserve its, uh, its victory. Um, she emerged as the face of the victory. She made a famous speech in, at Tisbury where she, uh, proclaim the uh, marvels of the English Navy, but uh, it was all, in a sense, kind of an illusion or hypocrisy because the way she actually treated them was uh, perhaps disgraceful is the right word. Anyway, next slide, please. Um, oh, I just to back up a little bit, I had mentioned that you know the first battle, which preceded the battle of the Spanish Armada, was in the it was in. Cadiz Harbor in Spain, and this is a, an artist's impression of it, but the idea was there were a lot of ships, uh, English ships that squeezed in there uh, looking for targets, uh, Drake among, you know, among them looking, uh, but didn't find many. The Spain was rather slow to anger, uh, but after this provocation, that's when they, they came after England and uh, in a concerted way. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this was toward the end of Drake's life. Um, after all, Drake managed to survive. He was one of the survivors of the Battle of the Spanish Armada. 
Um, he went back to that big Buckland Abbey, uh, which we saw he was still discontent. Um, he still continued to go out and chase the Spanish. This was a sort of a lifelong obsession of his. Um, this was uh, a route, a map showing uh, one of his last, um, uh, two of his last missions um, in, in off, the, off the West Indies. And he uh, continued to search for gold and he didn't really need to do this, but he just, he kept doing it. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and um, he, he planned uh, to attack Santa Domingo. Um, it didn't work. Um, it was a, a failed, uh, a failed um, attack. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and uh, meanwhile, at home, uh, Spain, uh, England, became more and more under the um, influence of this gentleman, Sir Francis Walsingham, who was a pilgrim, uh, I'm sorry, was a Puritan, and uh, was very, very strict, um, and, uh, you know, that didn't really give much credit to Drake for uh, all his accomplishments. Uh, next slide, please. Um, oh, I had mentioned Lord Howard of Effingham. He was the uh, Admiral of the Armada fleet. Um, here is a, a formal portrait of him. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, this is a map from that era. You can get some sense of how it looked to the participants in their, in their era. Next slide, please. Uh, Here's Drake, uh, and later in life, you can see his girth is somewhat expanded. Um, he had a big scar on his cheek, which he had picked up on the circumnavigation, uh, which uh, in, an, in a short uh, conflict with some uh, locals, but you don't see it in the paintings. Um, he also walked with a limp. Um, again, a, a, an injury that he had uh, suffered um, on that circumnavigation, uh, but this was, uh, this was a famous portrait of Drake. Um, next, next slide, please. Um, Drake um, died on one of these um, ill-fated missions um, off the coast, I think of Venezuela. I know of Venezuela. Um, again, hunt, you know, hunting quite unnecessarily for more ships from Spain. Um, he died of dysentery, which was very common. Uh, there was no cure for it. Uh, he knew he was sick when, when he got it. He knew that would be the end. Um, he had, uh, he left instructions to be buried uh, on land, but the, they weren't uh, obeyed. He was in fact uh, buried at sea and no one knows exactly his final resting place. Um, his, his body was put inside of a uh, metal coffin um, and, and lowered and uh, to the, into the water and, that was Drake's uh, final resting place. Uh, let's go on to the next slide. There we go. That's, um, at, you know, more or less at the end of the story of uh, Francis Drake, but England had changed dramatically uh, because of his efforts. It had become, uh, you had the, the beginnings of an empire. Um, Elizabeth's uh, rule was so, which was so uncertain at first, was, you know, by now firmly established. And uh, England had become, uh, thanks in large part to him, a sea power, which had, had, had not been before. So those are a few remarks about uh, Francis Drake, um, which I, you, you'll, you can uh, read more about him in my book, um, In Search of an Empire, and which gives some idea of you know, the full record of Drake's accomplishments. Thank you, Mr. Bergman. That was that was excellent. Um, uh, you, obviously, you you talk you you cover Drake's life. Um, you you mentioned in your book why he was so obsessed with uh, um, with Spain. That, that that you know, as a, as he he was a Protestant, there Catholic, but but talk about his personal. Uh, animosity towards towards Spain like what what happens to him in his life right right he did have personal animosity it was on for several reasons uh, first of all um, one of his 
the Spanish Empire and the Spanish Inquisition was an immense and, and fearsome operation that spread out way beyond Spain over a, a good part of Europe. And they had captured one of his uh, cousins and uh, kept him in captivity for years in South America, perhaps start, tortured him. And uh, so he was always horrified of falling into Spanish hands himself, because if he did, um, it would have been, you know, he, at the least, he would have been tortured. Um, Spain, he became eventually a very uh, uh, despised person in Spain. The other thing was, on one of these early missions, uh, when he was a young man, when he was serving with John Hawkins, um, he witnessed Spanish cruelty up close in their encounters. And he found them to be you know, inhumanly cruel um, and, you know, dis and conceived this lifelong animosity, which motivated everything he did. I had mentioned how at, at the end of his life, it was, you know, sort of unnecessary for him to go off on, on more uh, military missions, uh, naval missions, but he went anyway. But uh, he, um, hating Spain was part of what motivated him. But it was a little more complicated than Drake than that. There's always something a little more complicated than Drake. Uh, whenever he encountered a Spanish captain, um, he was very gallant to him. And Drake, uh, his touch, his personal touch in raiding ships was to leave behind a souvenir, his way of saying uh, Francis Drake was here. So if he uh, raided, when he raided a ship, he left behind some sort of a souvenir of Francis Drake. Uh, treated the captains well with respect, although even though it was through gritted teeth because he despised them. And uh, he, they, you know, so we had this, um, you know, rather complicated ritual way of uh, uh, treating the Spanish. You, you also mentioned in your book too, you know, that uh, kind of an under underreported, I guess, part of Drake's life was being a slave trader. And, and yet uh, he, he obviously does an about face and helps some freed slaves. Talk about, talk about his life as, a, as in, you know, going from one, one end of the extreme to the other. Sure. Uh, let, you know, it's important to keep in mind, you know, what we mean by that. Drake, Drake was not a, uh, an abolitionist or anything like that in his, you know, his era. He, uh, it was just he was you know acting on what he saw and um, you know he saw the cruel treatment very very cruel treatment of uh, slaves who were basically used and you know expended within a matter of weeks or months uh they uh and 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 treated um, i would say worse than animals in a way um so that you know that just riled him that his sense of uh uh, his sense of injustice, you know, was, was really, really riled. Um, the other part of it was that uh, he um, thought that uh, he found himself to, on two occasions, um, in, which I write about in the book. Um, one, one was with the Cimarrons, who I mentioned briefly, um, on the verge of becoming a leader of this uh, group of people and in uh, Central America, not because he desired it, it seemed to happen spontaneously. They responded to him as a leader. There was something about his charisma or his leadership skills that made them want to trust this outsider, this foreigner. Um, uh, and the same thing happened again a number of years later, near the end of his circumnavigation, when he encountered the Miwok Indians. Um, there are just a few of them left now but they were much more numerous in the Northwest uh, when Drake got there. And he was fascinated by the Miwok. Uh, they were one of the few tribes that had not been molested by the Spanish. And so regarded him, you know, in an even handed way uh, rather than in an antagonistic way. And he spent a lot of time with them. So did his men. And the Miwok wanted Drake um, and, and some of his men to stay and, uh, and, and show them how to do things and to lead them. Um, and again, Drake considered it, uh, but decided he didn't want to do it. He wanted to get back to England and all the riches and fame that he felt would await him there. But I thought that spoke to something about his character that these two very different kinds of peoples in different parts of the world uh, saw something in, in Drake, recognized something. 
uh, that made them want to, you know, make this uh, extraordinary offer to him. And uh, there's no, we don't really have any records of Drake mistreating uh, people um, during the circumnavigation. We don't even have much, many records of Drake killing people. Magellan was responsible for hundreds of deaths. It was a big body count. Um, you know, not so with Drake. Uh, and uh, so he had a, a much more strategic uh, approach or tactical approach to things. And he was not, although he was a certainly a pirate, you know, he was not a bloodthirsty person. What navigational tools did uh, Drake use during his circumnavigation of the world? He had the same as Magellan, basically. He had maps, um, he had compasses, which were very primitive. And then he had his own, uh, you know, sense as a captain of winds and tides and currents, uh, and things like that. Um, you know, uh, and Magellan had very skillfully kid kidnapped pilots as he went, um, who could guide him from one place to another. Uh, Drake didn't feel the need to do that because he could rely on the charts that had been compiled from Magellan's route. So that was uh, very helpful. Um, and uh, also, Magellan had made this discovery, which he didn't, you know, took him a while to understand, of the trade winds, uh, which carried him across the Pacific. Uh, you know, Drake knew that the trade winds were coming up and, you know, planned to uh, make use of them the same way. So uh, he, he, he could build on the accomplishments that, that Magellan did. Among the books you've written, you, you've written, obviously, you talked about Magellan. Uh, you've written about Columbus, Marco Polo, um, uh, uh, and, and in here with, uh, with Drake. What is it about these explorers, these uh, uh, these people who are pushing the envelope? What is it about them that uh, that fascinates you? Oh, because it's always mysterious to me. It always seems like a magic journey um, through an unknown world, even though you know we know it's real. And uh, the records they leave behind are fascinating. To try and see things through their eyes um, is is really interesting because. Uh, you see how their appreciation or apprehension of the world increases, and they encounter things which they don't understand. Um, they, you know, they they try to comprehend. Um, the, all these exploration books that I um, have written came out of a an earlier book of mine, which was somewhat different, called Voyage to Mars, which is sort of an unlikely uh, origin. But I wrote a book about NASA's robotic exploration of Mars. Uh, that was that was a book published back in 19 in 2000 and um, there was a science team that i was following uh, one of the um, missions called mars global surveyor the science team was very very intense they were committed to mapping you know mars and uh, in great detail and uh, i remember talking with them afterwards and asking them where what, what precedence did they use and they kept talking about the age of discovery as a precedent, which uh, of course things were different. They were not after gold or uh, you know toppling regimes. This was all you know in search of knowledge, um, and it was different. But and they kept referring to Magellan uh, was the first one. Um, there was a spacecraft that went to uh, Mars, a NASA spacecraft called Magellan, and I, which and I thought, oh, that might be interesting. And then that led me to like began to wonder about the actual Magellan. I think I had mentioned that, you know, I had uh, always loved being on the water, um, especially when I was younger, sailing with my son, and this sort of tied into that. And then once I glommed on to uh, Ferdinand Magellan, and there wasn't that much about him that was interesting or worthwhile in English, um, that uh, you know, I thought this could be very, very interesting. When you write about exploration and discovery, you discover there are different manuscript traditions, uh, Spanish, especially, English, uh, to a lesser extent, French, and even Latin. Um, I decided it was really important to get, you know, use them all. And if I couldn't read them myself, in some of these languages I can read, um, get the ones that I couldn't read uh, translated so that I could collate them all. 
so that we could get a complete or more complete picture of what these voyages were like. So uh, then, so then I was kind of off and running because one voyage led to another and led to another. And in some ways, uh, and Drake was the capstone because he, you know, tied together earlier accomplishments. And, uh, you know, as I, as I mentioned, he was not, Drake was not a reflective figure. He was not, um, you know, histor you know, he didn't realize, he didn't think of himself in a historical context. He really just thought about gold. He was a man of action, you know, not, not a uh, historian. Um. And before I, uh, before I let you go, I, I, I have to mention to the audience some of your other topics, which fascinate me. I, 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 as you, you've got as eclectic group of biographies I've ever seen. You've, you've written about Casanova, Al Capone, Louis Armstrong, Irving Berlin, James Agee. What is a, what is a, what do you, how do you pick a subject and how do you find them fascinating and what's and and what what will be your next subject i don't know the next subject i'm thinking about it now and uh often i say that these subjects find me uh, occasionally um an editor will suggest what well, that happened with um, irving berlin an editor suggested it to me i'm not sure i would have thought of that one on my own um you know i read a tremendous amount and often it's my choice of subjects is influenced by uh, some of the reading that I've done or some of the traveling that I've done. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, you're right. It, it is a varied bunch. I mean, Capone, I mean, Capone, A.G., Louis Armstrong, they're all iconic figures from the 1920s, you know, American figures. So they do have, uh, you know, that in common. And, uh, but some of them, I really, I don't know where the Louis Armstrong book came from. It just, you know, I mean, I can tell you how I did it, but you know, the idea just sort of seemed to come out of nowhere. Um, and, uh, but sometimes they, you know, they, they do, they do come out of somewhere. As I mentioned, the, the Magellan book was, you know, originated at NASA because I watched all these NASA scientists who kept referring back to the age of discovery. And I, I think um, voyages are a great way to understand history because you, see you see it um being tested and explored in uh in ways that uh you know it's not static and i i like the idea of telling the story that keeps moving where the outcome is uncertain where people are being tested uh where there's a protagonist so i, I enjoy that kind of narrative well i want to thank you for doing this tonight thank you for taking the time to uh to join us and talk about your book um uh, this has been a great pleasure, and I, I, I wish you great success with this, and, and uh, keep us posted on what your next, next topic will be. Well, as soon as I know. If you have an idea, let me know. All right. Well, thank you for doing this, everybody. Uh, good night, and good night, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, stay safe. <laughs>